and will be put at decision time. The next item of business is consideration of a further Parliamentary Bureau motion. I would ask Joe Fitzpatrick on behalf of the Bureau to move motion 6257 on the approval of the prohibited procedures on protected animal exemptions Scotland Amendment Regulations 2017. Moved on behalf of the Bureau. Thank you very much. <clears throat> now, I believe several members would wish to speak in this debate. Um, I will call on members in order. Each member has up to four minutes. I call Finlay Carson. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Right across the Chamber, I recognise and understand why tail shortening is a highly emotive topic. Firstly, can I state that my colleagues and I on these benches strive for the highest level of animal welfare. The Environment, Climate Change and Land Reform Committee sat through many hours of evidence from both sides of the argument. A wide range of people from gamekeepers to farmers, all of whom are dog lovers and committed to with the welfare of dogs, have contrib contributed to the committee's evidence, expressing their support for changes to the legislation. But let me make it clear, we are supportive of, a, of the ban in place on tail docking. But having considered the available evidence very carefully, we have taken the decision to support the government in creating an exemption to the ban on tail shortening for a very, very limited number of working dogs. I think it's important to make clear exactly what this exemption will mean. The exemption will permit the shortening by up to a third and by a vet of the tails of spaniel and hunt point retriever puppies where a vet believes they are likely to be used as a working dog and possibly risk serious tail injuries later in life. Tail shortening will, or tail docking will quite rightly continue to be illegal for the vast majority of dog breeds. This will bring us in, into line with similar exemptions that already exist in the rest of the UK. We believe that permitted tail shortening will reduce the incidence of painful injuries that a working dog can sustain later in life, injuries that could lead to the amputation of a dog's tail. Let us not forget, and I'm sure on this we can agree across the chamber, that all vets are committed to improving animal health and welfare. Vets will always act in the best interest of the animals they are treating. We are allowing vets to make professional, informed and considered decisions as to whether a puppy presented to them from a breed of dog with a higher chance of a tail injury is likely to be used as a working dog, and that is the right decision to take. I have trust in our vets. I trust them to make the right decision to reduce the risk of extreme suffering for working dogs. On balance, on these benches, we believe that tail shortening is a humane method of reducing the chance of the undisputed extreme pain and long-term suffering that tail injuries can cause uh, uh, working dogs. It is for these reasons that the Scottish Conservatives will support the SSI today. Thank you. Thank you very much. I now call on David Stewart. Uh, thank you, President Officer. Uh, I rise to oppose the SSI before us this evening. I As Scottish SPCA have made clear, the tail docking of dogs in Scotland was banned in 2007 under the Animal Health and Welfare Scotland Act. The Parliament looked at the evidence then and by an overwhelming majority passed the legislation. This Parliament was recognised worldwide for putting animal welfare first. To pass this SSI tonight would be a retrograde step for animal welfare. <laughs> President officer, let me be clear. No animal welfare or veterinary organisation has supported the proposal to overturn the ban. The Dogs Trust were deeply saddened by the proposal. The Blue Cross warned that it was changing a strong stance on animal welfare based on a narrow range of responses with little consideration of the negative implications. And the BVA confirmed its opposition to the exemption and warned it's a backward step when previously Scotland had led on animal welfare. Before I proceed, President Officer, let me quote from a hard-working Highland vet, Matthew Erskine, a member of the British Veterinary Association. He tells me that tear docking and shortening involves, and I'm quoting, the cutting through or crushing of skin, muscles and up to seven pairs of nerves, bone and cartilage in puppies under five days old without anaesthetic. BVA considers that puppies suffer unnecessary acute pain as a result of docking potentially resulting in chronic pain and are deprived of a vital form of canine expression 
And a survey carried out by Noonan et al said that 76% of vets believe that tail docking causes significant pain and no vets believe the procedure was free of pain. And the veterinary record published an article by David Morton said, should the tail wag the dog? He said that between two and 108 puppies would need to suffer the pain and distress caused by tail docking in order to bring the prevalence of tail injury down to that of a non-working breed. And he says, and I'm quoting presiding officer, by any calculation, still more animals need to be docked than are injured. So even based on a pragmatic utilitarian argument, it's still questionable whether this is acceptable. Surely it is better just to treat those injured as the total sum of overall harm would be far less than that caused by docking all puppies in a litter as a preventative measure. Enforcement of the regulations are also problematic. Only a vet can carry the tear shortening procedure. But the vet must be satisfied that the dog, aged five days or less, is definitely going to be used for work in connection with the lawful shooting of animals. How will this work in practice? Well, breaching the regulations, as was outlined in evidence to the ECR committee, can result in both sanctions by vets' professional bodies and criminal proceedings under the Animal Welfare Scotland Act that includes imprisonment. Presiding officer, in conclusion, like many here, I'm proud of this parliament and our achievements. Free personal care, the smoking ban, the Scottish-Malawi partnership, to name but a few. Animal welfare is up there as well. Maybe not so much headline grabbing, but significant, important, progressive. I feel proud to be part of such a parliament. Today could be a turning point when we put aside party interests and think about who we are and how we carry ourselves. I urge members to oppose this SSI. All that's needed now is the will to do and the soul to dare. Thank you. And I call Mark Ruskell. Thank you. Um, Presiding officer, I'm one of the few members of this current parliament who considered the evidence around tail docking when the animal welfare bill passed just over a decade ago. And I'm also somebody who's actually witnessed a tail do docking operation in a litter of puppies. And it gives me no pleasure to have to rise to oppose this ill-conceived, illogical, anti-scientific reversal of what was a progressive policy to protect the welfare of dogs. The American historian Henry Brooke Adams once said that practical politics consists in ignoring facts. So let's look at the facts that will be ignored by the majority of SNP and Tory members in this chamber if they press their buttons in defense of tradition and against the science of veterinary medicine. Christine Graham. I thank the member. Does the member agree with me that with BVA Scotland, animal welfare organisations throughout Scotland and 70% of the public opposing exemptions to the ban on tail docking, which is its proper name, that backbenchers, particularly on the SNB benches, should vote tonight because of their impartial and informed opinions and reject exemptions to tail docking? <laughs> Mark Ruskell. So, officer, I'm delighted to support Christine Graham on this issue and I commend the leadership that she's shown on animal welfare issues for many, many years in this parliament. I just hope more of her colleagues will join her tonight and the rest of us. Presiding officer, tail docking in a puppy is a painful tail amputation. It's not a shortening, it's an amputation that is required to be carried out without pain relief. It makes no difference in terms of pain as to whether the tail is totally removed or partially removed. And by the government's own admission, this law will require at least 80 puppies' tails to be amputated to prevent an injury requiring amputation in a single adult working dog. How is that a net benefit to animal welfare? Does a puppy feel 80 times less pain than an amputated adult dog? Where's the veterinary evidence for this? Well, let's be clear where this proposal started. It began with Richard Lockhead in 2007, a new minister understandably keen to placate the country's sports lobby. What then followed was a series of flawed studies. The first one, based on a self-selecting survey of shooters, asked to report tail injuries in working dogs. A biased, campaigning piece of research led by traditionalists, not veterinary evidence. 
A second study then looked at populations of working breed dogs, but there was a complete failure to investigate other more damaging causes of tail injury, such as poor kenneling, and no analysis of alternatives to protect working dogs, such as tail sheathing. There was no research into the negative impact of tail docking on behavior, communication, and potential confrontations between dogs. Professor Donald Broom, in his evidence to committee, said that, and I quote, removing a significant part of a dog's tail is like preventing a significant part of human speech. Yet this government wants to allow this to happen to working dogs without any analysis of the behavioral problems it could cause dogs and people. A promised third study into the actual tail injuries of actual working dogs based on veterinary cases was never commissioned. But why bother, presiding officer, when the, with the evidence when you have the votes already in the bag? The Green Party agrees with every single veterinary professional body in the UK that the reintroduction of tail docking for working breeds dogs is wrong on animal welfare grounds. Scotland had the most progressive animal welfare laws anyway in the, in, anywhere in the UK at the end of that bill. But now we see the Scottish Government attempting a race to the bottom to mirror the weak legislation loopholes that exist in England. Presiding officer, we need rationality, reason and evidence brought to the Parliament whenever a change of the law is proposed. This proposal shamefully has none of these. It is a backward step. It is a dangerous precedent for this Parliament to set. And I'll call Liam MacArthur. Thank you, President Officer. Can I start by uh, thanking all those on the Environment, Climate Change and Land Reform uh, Committee for the diligence of the work that they carried out in scrutinising this uh, statutory instrument. Uh, this cannot have been an easy task, bo views both for and against amending the current blanket ban on tail docking are strongly and I believe sincerely held. I'm also conscious that unlike uh, other speakers uh, in this afternoon's brief debate, I have not had the benefit of sitting through all of the evidence uh, presented to the committee. Nevertheless, this is an issue uh, with which I am familiar and I'm grateful to the various organisations for the detailed briefings they have provided in the run-up today, not least because of the short notice they would have been given uh, of this debate and the vote. At this point, I see very little purpose in rehearsing the arguments again that we have heard uh, from Finlay Carson, David Stewart, and Mark Ruskell. Suffice to say, Scottish Liberal Democrats accept that the basis for the case being made both for and against the proposed change is founded on welfare concerns. Inevitably, those concerns will be weighted differently by different people. And on that basis, it seems inappropriate, as I think Christine Graham rather forcefully and rightly pointed out, to apply a party whip to this decision. And therefore, colleagues will vote accordingly. Thank you. I now call on Rosanna Cunningham to wind up the debate. Thank you, Presiding Officer. The 2010 regulations uh, did impose an outright ban on tail docking of dogs, all dogs. Today's draft regulations would amend them to allow an exemption for tail shortening by a veterinary surgeon in limited circumstances, but only for the purpose of benefiting dog welfare and only in connection with breeds used in shooting activities. This is a very emotive and divisive issue, but there are welfare issues on both sides of the debate, as Liam MacArthur indicated. We firmly believe that shortening the tails of puppies at risk of tail injury while engaged in lawful shooting activities in later life will improve the welfare of those dogs. Research commissioned from the University of Glasgow showed around one-seventh of working dogs in one shooting season alone sustained at least one tail injury with a higher incidence for certain breeds. However, in line with the research findings, we intend that shortening should apply to only those most at risk. The proposed exemption therefore applies to the only two types of working dogs, spaniels and hunt point retrievers, that are most at risk and most commonly used in these lawful activities. The regulations also ensure, as far as possible, that only those dogs likely to be used for lawful shooting purposes can have their tails shortened, and only by veterinary surgeons. The operating vet must be satisfied with... I'm sorry, but I need to finish this. The operating vet must be satisfied with the evidence produced showing that the dog is likely to be used for working in later life. 
This amendment will place the responsibility for making the decision in the hands of those best placed to make an informed professional judgment. And these are the practicing veterinary surgeons, mostly in rural Scotland, who know the clients who are working dog breeders, understand the risks of injury associated with normal shooting activities, and most importantly, also have a professional duty to ensure the welfare of all animals in their care. Individual vets will, of course, be under no obligation to shorten tails if they do not believe it is in the best interests of the animals they are presented with. Now, mention has correctly been made of tails being used for communication. Also, the term amputation instead of shortening has been used in a number of instances with an implication that the whole of a tail would be removed. However, the evidence showed no greater reduction in the probability of injury by removing more than the end third of the tail. The draft regulations therefore limit shortening to that extent. Dogs with two thirds of their tail and all of their other ways of using body language to communicate will still be able to socialize normally, something that anyone who has ever seen a working spaniel happily and vigorously wagging a tail that has already been shortened will understand. Yes, tail shortening is briefly painful, but that has to be weighed against the often prolonged recovery from serious tail surgery in an adult dog who has suffered pain before treatment and may also suffer in recovery. And the pictures of those injuries are every bit as shocking as anything else members may have seen. The evidence suggests that working dogs with a shortened tail are up to 20 times less likely to injure their tails in later life. Yep. I therefore ask you to follow the recommendation of the committee and support this amendment. Whatever your personal views on shooting as a sport, I believe this amendment is proportional, based on the best evidence we have, and most importantly, will improve the welfare of dogs involved in this lawful activity. Can I thank the Minister? We're going to move to decision time at... Oh. Point of order, Mr Finlay. President officer, I seek your advice on uh, what we're voting on uh, today at decision time in relation to the motion on freedom of information. The motion uh, before us to be accepted in full and then amended by the government calls for an independent inquiry into the way the government has dealt with freedom of information and not a review by the information commissioner or indeed anything else other than an independent inquiry and post-legislative scrutiny. It's important we know what we're voting for because listening to the hapless minister today, he seems to be under the impression, he seems to be under the impression that we are voting for something else. I'm sure you, like me, would want members to be vote, not, would, wouldn't want members to be voting for the wrong thing. So can you offer me and others a bit of help, helpful guidance on what we are actually voting for? Can I thank the member for advance notice of his point of order? Uh, I note the concerns the members raise, but I don't believe in this case uh, it is up to the chair to interpret the member or the minister's remarks. The motion before the Parliament puts a proposition to members. It's up to members to debate that point and take a view on the proposition before Parliament. Once or if the proposition is agreed, it becomes a resolution of the Parliament and it will then be up to the government to decide how to respond to that resolution appropriately. Thank the member for the point of order. Uh, we now come to decision time. A number of questions. The first one being that Amendment 6126.1 in the name of Joe Fitzpatrick, which seeks to amend motion 6126, in the name of Edward Mountain, on freedom of information requests, be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are all agreed. The next question is that motion 6126, in the name of Edward Mountain, as amended, on freedom of information requests, be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are agreed. The next question is that amendment 6186.4 in the name of Fergus Ewing, which seeks to amend motion 6186 in the name of Peter Chapman on agriculture, be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. We're not agreed. We'll have a division and members may cast their votes now.
The result of the vote on the amendment in the name of Fergus Ewing is yes, 61, no, 57. There were six abstentions. The amendment is therefore agreed. The next question is the amendment 6186.1 in the name of Rhoda Grant, which seeks to amend the motion in the name of Peter Chapman on agriculture be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. We're not agreed. We'll move to a division and members may cast their votes now. The result of the vote on the amendment in the name of Rhoda Grant is yes, 57, no, 61. There were six abstentions. The amendment is therefore not agreed. The next question is that, a motion, is that motion 6186 in the name of Peter Chapman as amended on agriculture be agreed? Are we all agreed? Yes. We're not agreed. We'll move to a vote again and members may cast their votes now. The result of the vote on motion 6126 in the name of Edward Mountain as amended. Sorry, yes. In the name of Peter Chapman. 6186 in the name of Peter Chapman as amended is yes, 80, no, 36. There were eight abstentions. The motion as amended is therefore agreed. Now, I propose to ask a single question on nine parliamentary bureau motions. This does not include the motion on tail docking. If any member objects, please say so now. No member has objected. Therefore, the question is that motions 6243, 6245 to 6246, 6250, 6251, 6253 to 6256, all in the name of Joe Fitzpatrick, be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are agreed. And the final question is that motion 6257 in the name of Joe Fitzpatrick on approval of the prohibited procedures on protected animal exemption Scotland amendment regulations be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. We're not agreed. We'll move to a division and members may cast their votes now. The result of the vote on motion 6257 in the name of Joe Fitzpatrick is yes, 86, no, 29. There were nine abstentions. The motion is therefore agreed. Now that concludes decision time. We'll now move to members' business in the name of Alexander Stewart on stroke care in Scotland. And we'll just take a few moments for members to change seats. <coughs> 